Heavenly Father, thank you for bringing us all here together this evening to do what we all need to do for this great land. Protect our soldiers and sailors wherever they are dispersed throughout the world. All these things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And you be seated, please. Announcements. Uh, I'll just kind of go through them quickly because we're going to have an abbreviated uh, front front end of the program tonight because we've got a very special guest speaker, and we're going to just one speaker tonight. And we're going to give him as much time as we can. And so, for those of you who are thinking about open mic, we're going to abbreviate that as well. It's going to be one minute, and if. If you don't really have uh, something you absolutely feel like you're called to uh, announce, maybe we can defer that to the next meeting or after, after the meeting when we're networking, uh, because we want to give this speaker as much time as we can. Candidates, however, will get their usual three minutes, and you know how that is. We try to keep them from doing five. Politicians are what they are. You know, they just, it's an it's a, uh, institutional hazard. They like to talk, but we're we're glad to hear them talk and be here, aren't we? Yeah. You know, it's a it's a it's a certain amount of courage to run for office these days, and then it's a whole different level uh, of courage to say that you can pal up to a bunch of Tea Party activists. So I think that's uh, I think that's great uh, for us that they'll come. Uh, free uh, free speech. You know how we are about free speech. Is there anybody from the press here? We always like to out you because if you're not proud to say you're at the press, then, then uh, we'll give you a bad time afterwards. But we believe in free speech, but we believe also in personal accountability. So anything you say here tonight is, you know, you've got your moment, you get your time, but you're accountable for your speech. Uh, newsletter volunteers, you get that newsletter? Everybody happy with it? Boy. <laughs> That's a hard one. Isn't it? You know, uh, our newsletter chair, you know, he's gone to Pierce County. He lives there and he keeps on supporting us. So we're really looking for somebody to come up and help us with the newsletter. If you have it in your heart to volunteer, we could use your help. Um, as always, in all of our events and all of our activities are supported by your donations. And so. If, uh, if, if you're not generously giving, we can't uh, generously give back. So please consider that. Uh, there are uh, blue, and there's a red bucket. No, nope, just two blue buckets back there. Three. Um, and if you'd be so kind as to keep us paying the rent, <laughs> maybe even pay the heat. <laughs> maybe that's the problem. Um, we're going to skip some of this stuff, but... You know, before we get into our speaker tonight, I want to tell you how important May is. Because I'm not going to probably mention this uh, uh, at the end of the meeting. We'll go right into some networking with our guest speaker. May is a big month for Kids at Patriot Tea Party. And uh, Dana, why don't you come up front and tell us a little bit about the flag waving days. Oh. Okay. You all know Dana, right? The man of many words. <laughs> okay, um, on the 7th of May, we've got the response to Ground Zero um, doing the demonstration at Bangor's Main Gate. will be at the Trigger Gate, uh, the one from 12 to 2. And on the, the 28th, the 28th? Yeah. We got the Unforgotten Run, which would be the uh, unclaimed veterans' remains being escorted to Tahoma Cemetery. And we'll be at the uh, Bethel Burley overpass. And I think we have 11 o'clock for uh, being in place. So you don't want to miss either one of them, they're the important ones. All right. Thank you, Dave. I always like to give Dave as much opportunity as possible. 
So that's two special flag waving events this month. They're both very important, right? All of them are important. How many of you have gone to the flag waving events? Aren't they great? Aren't they, don't you just get a little thrill? I mean, you could be like Chris Matthews, right? You get a little thrill up your leg when you do that kind of thing. And uh, uh, I work on Saturday, so I rarely get to go, but uh, they're just great events. So ground zero, the opposition ground zero, and that's going to be at the trigger gate instead of on the bridge. And then the unforgotten uh, run will be down at the overpass, the Bethel Burley. Is that right? Bethel Burley overpass? Yeah. And there's no direct exit for that, right? For those of you who are familiar, you either have to take the Sedgwick or the one after and turn around and come back to that bridge. So that'll be a very heartwarming event, and I hope you can make it. Uh, and then on the 23rd, the 23rd we're going to, we're collaborating on an event with the Silverdale Seabank Republican Women, and it's going to be uh, a great event on the 23rd, the same time, same place, same bat channel, right here, right? And I'm going to ask one of these uh, Republican women to come up and talk about that real quick. Would you mind? You know, I've got those flyers. We do have some flyers available. Uh, we are going to have Dr. Don Easterbrook speak about climate change. And um, he, he gives a lie to a lot of what you are hearing by the media. And so I think this is something that you will really want to come and hear him. He is um, a climate science scientist and glacier, glacier expert from Washington State. He's coming down from Bellingham. And we are very anxious. If you go on YouTube, you can hear him speak. And he's most convincing. So thank you, and I hope you will all come. Thank you, John. May 23rd, Monday, 7 o'clock to 9 o'clock. It's just a, a week in advance of our regular meeting, right? And uh, we hope to, uh, we, we really hope to bring a good turnout. So this is, I think, uh, our first uh, joint collaboration for a speaker. And so we're going to bring in half the county. They're going to be standing out there. Um, so get here early, right? Get here early to get your seat. So this will be fun. Uh, it'll be right here, right here, right here in the back cave. You can tell when I grew up, right? <laughs> and then Memorial Day, we will have a meeting, just like we have every year. And I haven't told her this yet because Sandy's so shy. But I'd like her to come up and talk since she made uh, arrangements about our special guests on Memorial Day. Sandy, could you come up? I'm shy too, and so I'm just, you know, not wanting to talk so much. Our May meeting is going to be entertaining. We're going to have the Coral Group, the Independents. We had them in our picnic a couple of years ago. And they are going to do a patriotic musical performance complete with videos. Uh, PowerPoint. PowerPoint. Slides. Slides. <coughs> and narration. And narration. <laughs> Why didn't you ask Sue to come up? She's, she's part of the independence. <laughs> so we have an in with the group because Sue Weaver is one of the singers. But it's going to be a great performance and it's bring, bring kids. It's not going to be a speaker, it's going to be just a musical performance. And I've heard them before and, and seen their slides and, and they do an incredible job. So bring the family, bring the kids, and, and have a good close to your Memorial Day weekend. Any questions on that? You know, two years ago they were great. We had that out at the Silverdale Park. We had the mics up, the big uh, uh, three tiers worth of singers. And it was well orchestrated, and it was just a beautiful, beautiful uh, uh, little concert they gave for our, our annual picnic. So this is the one, and there won't be there won't be any pontification. We're not having Bill O'Reilly or any of these other people here. It's just going to be a nice concert. So come and enjoy it. Come and enjoy it. Um, so that's May. So have you got your 
your iPhones out and your Androids and your and your calendars. Let's review this. May 7th, right? The opposition to ground zero, trigger gate, flag waving. How many are gonna be there? Okay, we got a lot of hands up. Now we're holding you to that. Now the next one is uh, May 28th, uh, Unforgotten Run in Bethel Burley Overpass, right? That's, uh, how many do you think can make that in advance? Oh, that's a, that's a lot of good hands. That's very good. Back a few days is the 23rd. And that will be the Dr. Don Easterbrook presentation on climate change and uh, his, his look and his research on the original data, which you'll be very surprised with. And that's our, our joint uh, uh, collaboration with the Silverdale. There's too many syllables. SSRW. Yeah, that, SSRW. And then, of course, Memorial Day, which we will be here with the independence. So that's going to be just a busy month, and we hope to see you at every event. Okay. That all said, well, thank you for coming. That's great. Okay, good, good. And just in time for open mic. So one minute open mic. If you'd like to have something that you, that's on your mind, uh, form up over here at the right because we don't do anything on the left, right? <laughs> And we're going to hold you to one minute. Where's my timekeeper? I think we have a timekeeper. There he is. He's got his hands up over here. And introduce yourself. And then we also have candidates for three minutes. So please come forward. And we're going to keep them brief today. I'm Naomi Evans. Uh, I am a Fermentation School Director. I spoke about this last time, but I wanted to remind you all, if you have interest, uh, we need more people to email or attend board meetings. There is a program called the Salem Kaiser Student Threat Assessment Program. Uh, this is a beast of a program that will profile our children and create files on them that we don't want. It covers um, due process issues that we also don't want for our community. So please email. Uh, you can email bsd at bremertonschools.org and just tell them a quick little reply of, tell them no on the Salem Kaiser Student Threat Assessment, if you would. And then, I'm also part of the Republican Party, and I just want to let you guys know we're having our Lincoln Day dinner coming up. I've posted some flyers back on this table. If you're interested, that's June 18th. Uh, the chairman's reception starts at 5.30, and then the general reception starts at 6. Um, more information can be found on kidsatrepublicans.com. Thank you. Wait, it's like we're following each other around today. I see the ladies up front here. I was there this morning. Thanks for having me there. Hey, my name is David Raymond. I'm uh, here tonight to uh, talk about the West Ham Women's Safety Expo and Fashion Show, Saturday, April 30th, so this coming Saturday, at the Baymont Inn and Suites down in the ballroom downstairs, uh, 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. Uh, $5 admission, age 15 and under are free. Uh, tickets are available at the Baymont Inn, the unique local bazaar inside the Kids at Mall. Camp Union Pizzeria out there on Holly Road in Camp Union. Online at www.eventbrite.com and the bright is B-R-I-T-E, eventbrite.com. Also, Dave Raymond has it. So at $5 each, if you want a ticket for it, uh, we're pre-selling. We will be selling at the door as well, so if you happen to be uh, in the area of the Baymont Inn next, this coming Saturday, it's uh, firearms, martial arts, uh, this will be a fashion show for the, show for the ladies uh, to check out the, the fun stuff. And dudes are allowed too, so come on, guys. All right. Thank you. Thanks a lot. <laughs> Open mic, one minute. All we want. I only need one minute. I'm here, I'm Phil Cook, I'm your uh, Kitsap County Assessor, and I'm just going to be here tonight just to remind you all that uh, your property taxes, your first hot property taxes are due by the 30th of this month. Oh, yeah. And I'm doing the job of the treasurer since so she's the one who's supposed to be reminding you all, but uh, I just thought I'd share that with you and let you know if you're not familiar with a variety of different exemption programs that our office administers for property taxes, 
please take a look at our website, kidsapgov.com. Go to the assessors page, and on the left-hand column, you'll find a thing for exemptions and tax relief. And we administer a variety of different programs, whether you're a senior citizen or you're remodeling your home. You know you can get a property tax exemption if you decide to remodel your home. Most people don't know that. Even the home builders didn't know that until we shared that with them. But take a look at that. If you have any questions, call our office. We're here to help you out in any way possible. All right? Thank you. Uh, thanks, everybody. I'm Marcus Carter with Kitsap Rifle and Revolver Club. Many of you have already heard that uh, Kitsap Rifle and Revolver Club is now making noise once again. Uh, we have had uh, um, already several complaints. The Sheriff's Department keeps responding because we're shooting high power 22s or whatever happens to be out there. Seriously. Uh, they, the first time they showed up, that's exactly what he found out there, but they said we were obviously shooting artillery or something to that effect, so uh, I don't expect that's going to end anytime real soon. Uh, the thing I wanted to point out was that the, your Department of Community Development here at Kitsap County, because they, uh, David Lynham, the fire marshal, had said that we didn't provide the information that we were supposed to provide, which we had. Uh, I simply drew in less than five minutes X's and boxes uh, in, in areas where people shouldn't stand when we're shooting and then highlighted a wetlands. And, but because he put so much junk in the record, it cost us over $10,000 for and a two week delay for lawyers having exhibits, subpoenas. And when they saw that we were gonna subpoena these people and put them on the record and get them under oath, all of a sudden they decided, oh, yeah, well, I guess it's okay and, and we're not gonna fight in reopening. So, but, you know, as I told the commissioners tonight with these million dollar budgets that they keep, you know, going through and hundreds of thousands of dollars, $10,000 to a small not-for-profit or to a homeowner is absolutely unforgivable. They need to change things. We need to change the way we do business here in, in uh, Kitsap County, as you all know. Thank you. And our only three-minute candidate tonight. Well, which doesn't mean that she's only going to be a candidate for three minutes, right? No, I think it's gone way too far for that. <laughs> so my name is Loretta Burns, and I'm running for state representative in the 23rd Legislative District, which if you don't know, covers North Kitsap, Bainbridge, East Bremerton, Manette, and all those areas. And I'm not really a politician. I decided to run only a couple months ago after going to the Roanoke Conference and really fully realizing that I'm actually a conservative. Now, some of you, if you've looked at my background, may not think that, but it's true. Um, I have brochures here, and I have a website, and I have a sign-up sheet. I need your help, whatever you can do. And now I'll tell a little bit about myself. Um, I decided to go into international development when I was 19, uh, in part because I wanted to do something, and I wanted to have some impact. And to be honest, I didn't really feel very needed here in the United States. It just seemed like we had things pretty good. So I went overseas, I got my bachelor's degree at WSU, in Coors, and my master's at um, Oregon State University in Agricultural and Natural Resource Economics. And I spent 17 years in Bangladesh and Africa, so after living in places like Rwanda and Sierra Leone, I'm really not that afraid of people of the Kitsap Tea Party, sorry. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, but what I learned from that experience is I, I designed and managed government funded projects, international development projects. In between, I also was here and I worked for employment security for state government. And I've seen how uh, legislation turns into, uh, policies turn into regulations that turn into bureaucracies that turn into staff. And before you know it, you're spending more on the staff than the benefit. And I'm a very analytical person, and so I look at those things very closely. And Scott, who stepped out, knows because I've been very involved in watching our school district. And, um, and I'm very supportive of what Naomi's been doing. Because if you don't look at what's going on in the educational system, it's actually very invasive. And it's really not leading to a higher quality of education. So that's been the one area where I've really been focused and um, and I care most about and need to do something about. Has that been three minutes? Two and a half. Oh, okay. So um, I guess that's it. And I need donations. 
And oh, and I've been going to a lot of meetings. The best part of this campaign has really been talking with people and learning. I finally have brochures. I should have envelopes soon that you can write a check even without an envelope committing to elect Loretta Burns. So thank you. Does anybody know this fellow up here? Yeah. 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 Good evening, I'm Scott Hendon. I don't know if all of you have seen that Kitsap Transit wants to start a passenger ferry run. In this county, we've seen once, twice, three times a failure of that to work with different groups. So um, I'm just kind of getting out there a little bit and saying, is anybody interested in state PDC office? Although if we spend less than 500, we wouldn't have to, but um, I just don't want to give money for inefficient transportation. I'm not opposed to uh, efficiency and, and well-ran uh, public services, but I think this is just a total boondoggle. So let me know if you're interested in that. Any last announcements? Okay, the really big shoe is right up here next. So our special guest, First uh, came to us about two years ago, as I recall, and at the uh, picnic grounds, had a book, great speaker, world traveler, U.S. traveler, has a unique study and perspective on politics here in the United States, and some insight that I think you will find both refreshing and informative. Ladies and gentlemen, let's welcome our guest speaker tonight, Trevor Lowden. wearing the Kitsap Patriots yeah. Well, thank you very much. Can you all hear me okay? Yeah. Can you understand the Southern accent? <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks very much for having me here. It was great last time. I enjoyed it out in the park there. And it's, it's good to see a lot of familiar faces again. So thank you. A um, couple of additions since I've been here. I've, my, my wife, Victoria, is with me now. Philadelphia, and you'll be able to understand her okay, I think. <laughs> but I was, in, uh, I was in Los Angeles um, a while back, and I went up to a, um, a street vendor and I bought some food. And the guy gave me the food, I gave him the money, he said, look, you, you've got an accent, where, where are you from? I said, well, look, I'm from, I'm from New Zealand. He said, well, where's that? So to make it easy for him, I said, well, look, it's down by Australia. He said, ah, where Arnold Schwarzenegger comes from. <laughs> and he hasn't even done Common Core Geography yet, folks. <laughs> but he probably votes. But look, um, I've been touring this country for a long time now, and people always say to me the same thing. Why do I care about the United States? And I say there are two reasons. The first is simple gratitude. Now, my country was saved from invasion by the Japanese in World War II by the massive sacrifice of your fathers and uncles and grandfathers at the battles of Guadalcanal and the Coral Sea in Midway. And that's a very strong memory in my country, folks. The second reason is related, but it's a bit more selfish. Ronald Reagan had it right. This is the last best hope for mankind. If freedom should fail in the United States, if you lose your constitution, your liberty, your economic dynamism, and your military superiority, all of which are in grave danger right now, the bad guys of this planet, I'm talking Russia, China, Iran, Cuba, Nicaragua, Venezuela, North Korea, and their Islamic allies, and they are allies, people. They will carve up this planet amongst themselves. Now, if you're an ally of America right now, if you're Australia, or Germany, or Israel, or Canada, or Japan, or South Korea, or Taiwan, 
You're freaking out right now because you see that the president of this country loves the bad guys of the world a lot more than he loves the good guys. And that's causing big instability, folks. You know, your allies are looking at you and they are wondering if it's still worth being a friend of America. They saw what your president did to Poland and the Czech Republic. One of his first acts of office was to cancel the missile shield that was supposed to protect them from the Russians. Then they saw him abandon Georgia to the Russians. Then when there was a genuine rebellion in Iran against the Mullahs, the Green Revolution, Obama stood back and let that be squashed out. Thousands died. A chance to stop this Iranian nonsense was just frittered away. And then when the Communist Party of Egypt and the Muslim Brotherhood took out your ally Mubarak, Obama cheered them on. And now they're looking at the Ukraine, folks. And I think it's wise to remember what Napoleon said about the Ukraine. Whoever controls the Ukraine controls Europe. Whoever controls Europe controls the world. These are big stakes we're playing for here, folks. We know that if Putin takes the Ukraine, he will not stop there. There's no way he will stop there. But also remember, the Ukraine has a treaty signed in your Senate under Bill Clinton guaranteeing that country American protection from Russian military aggression. They gave up their nuclear arsenal in exchange for an American promise, folks. And now that they need it, where is it? So far, Obama has sent them a few hundred million dollars of non-lethal aid and John Kerry. <laughs> Think about it, folks. Who is John Kerry? He's basically Jane Fonda with less testosterone. <laughs> So, your allies, people, are pretty worried because when you think about this, do you think Putin would be trying to re-establish the old Soviet empire? Do you think China would be building 400 nuclear submarines right now and threatening Japan, the Philippines and Taiwan? Do you think Iran would be threatening the Middle East? Do you think ISIS would be committing unimaginable atrocities in Syria and Iraq right now if you had a Reagan in the White House today? But the world is going to hell in a handbasket, folks. We're on the verge of major war because this country has twice elected an anti-American president. And I want to call out a group of people right now, and you tell me if I'm being unfair with this, I'm being you know, a bit harsh. In Germany, before World War II, there was one organisation, one group, that could have stopped Hitler. They had the power and the moral authority. They had the numbers to do it. And that was the German churches. But they decided, no, we shall not oppose here Hitler. We will put swastikas in our churches. We will go along to get along. And what was the result of that attitude, people? Germany was devastated. Six million Jews died. Hundreds of thousands of your boys laid down your lives to, to sort out the mess. All because the German churches didn't take a stand. Well, right now in this country, we have 90 million people who call themselves evangelical Christians. 40 million of them registered to vote, and 20 million of them, of them actually do vote. The biggest untapped voting block in this country, folks. Well, right now, you have Christianity being obliterated in the Middle East. You have churches being burnt to the ground, thousands of Christians being slaughtered. Basically, Christianity is almost non-existent in the Middle East right now. 
Now, would that be happening today if you had a strong president in the White House, a patriotic president? Yet in the last two elections, American Christians could have spared us from Obama, folks. And we wouldn't have had a Mitt Romney or a John McCain if Christians had been voting in big numbers, you would have had powerful, strong, Reagan-like presidents, candidates to work from, folks. So is it a stretch to say that the blood of the Middle Eastern Christians is on the hands of the Christians in America who can't be bothered to even get involved? Or is that too harsh? Is that unfair? Or how many of those Christians do you think understand that the carnage in the Middle East is directly on their hands, folks? Because it is, people. The sin of omission is bigger than the sin of commission. It's what you don't do that you should have is worse than what you actually did wrong, folks. You imagine had Christians voted in big numbers in the last 40 years, you still have prayer in schools. You never would have had Roe v. Wade. And this country would be a lot stronger today, folks. Well, I think that's a message we need to sheet home in the churches of this country today. But I want to also think about this. This is not a... What you're facing in America right now, this, it's not about a depression... You know, you're Americans and you'll fight your way out of economic problems. This is not even about losing some of your rights because you're Americans and you'll stand up and take them back. But have you ever been in a position before where your commander-in-chief is alienating your allies, empowering your enemies and gutting your military? Your president wants to cut your nuclear arsenal down to 265 nukes and then down to zero. When the Russians alone have more than 8,000 people. He wants to cut your army down to, down to pre-World War II levels. Your navy down to the smallest navy since World War I. He's blowing off military contractors right, left and centre. He's cancelling every weapon systems he can. And he's driving thousands of good officers out of your military with the gay policies, women in combat, and rock-bottom morale. And how many of your candidates, people, have stood against women in combat? There's only one, and that's Ted Cruz, folks. Yep. You need to think about that. That is a hugely important issue for your military. There's no room for political correctness or social experiments that in your military that keeps you free, people. None whatsoever. So, you know, think about Obama. People say he's stupid. He's out of his debt. He doesn't understand foreign policy. If he was just stupid, would he not make a mistake in your favour once in a while? <laughs> You know, this guy was mentored by Frank Marshall Davis, the Hawaiian communist, on the FBI security index. He could have been arrested the very day the war broke out with the Soviet Union. He was that high up in the communist ranks. Then Obama got his first job in politics under Alice Palmer in Chicago, a woman who was visiting the Soviet Union, East Germany and Czechoslovakia on a regular basis. Both of these people were very active in the peace movement. The job of the peace movement, which has always been communist controlled, is to destroy your military, weaken your military alliances and cancel every possible weapon systems they can. They want to weaken your military to the benefit of, their, of your enemies. What do you think Frank Marshall Davis and Alice Palmer would think of the job that your president has done on your military, folks? Be pretty darn proud, don't you think? I think the most significant thing your president said 
in his entire first term of office when he was caught off mic in South Korea with then Russian President Dmitry Medvedev. Yes, Mr. Medvedev, when I get re-elected, I'll have more flexibility to deal with you. Yes, said Medvedev, I understand. I will pass your message on to Vladimir. We are with you. How much more blatant does it need to get, people? This guy is not on your side at all. With the books, I want to talk about my books over there, and I hope you'll get a copy, because if you're in a war, people, and if you can't know what your enemy is about, if you can't even identify your enemy, how can you fight a war and hope to win? So that is what it's about. Also, I have copies of Agenda 2 there today, too. Who's seen Agenda 1, grinding America down? Who thinks it's pretty good? Okay. Well, this is Agenda 2. New one's just come out. The best thing out there for people. Everybody's got a friend who knows there's something wrong, but doesn't know what it is. Well, this is, you bring them around, you show them this, they will know. It's great for that. But the book is really about the two big secrets of modern communism. The first secret, I think they borrowed from the devil. Because we all know that the cleverest thing the devil ever did was to convince people he doesn't exist. So what have the communists in this country been telling you in the last 20 years, folks? Pretty much the same thing, right? We don't exist, we're not a problem, don't worry about us. Why do you think they tell you that, folks? Because there's going to be a lot less resistance, is there not? Of course they're going to tell you that. What did the mafia used to say? We don't exist. We're not really here. This is a figment of your imagination. Why would they tell you that, people? Why would anybody tell you lies? Deceive you to get their way. The second big secret of modern communism, which is hardly ever discussed in the thousands of books on the subject, and is the ability of a tiny Marxist party, maybe a few hundred comrades strong, and it's their ability to influence and even control the legislative process in their country. In other words, right the laws. So what I'm telling you is this. You've got about 15,000 hardcore communists in your country, but they are able to write the laws that control the lives of more than 320 million Americans. How could they possibly do that? How is that even conceivable, folks? Who even thinks there's any communists left in this country? Most people don't. Well, the, the process is, there's several processes, but, but the main one is this. It's control of organized labor. Now, this should resonate in this state. People say, well, look, organized labor, the union stuff, way smaller than they used to be. Why, why worry about them? But you tell me this. You name me one elected Democrat in this state or this country from county commission to federal level who does not owe his job to the unions. You tell me one. For money, for manpower, for get out the vote, even vote fraud. It's the unions who are the backbone of the Democratic Party, folks. They would not survive without the unions. Now you were very lucky in America for a long time because your AFL-CIO was run by hardcore anti-communists like Lane Kirkland and George Meany. But in 1995, folks, everything changed. Six years after the fall of the Berlin Wall, that was the year that your communists took over the AFL-CIO. Democratic Socialists of America and the Communist Party USA. They, took, they kicked out Lane Kirkland, they put their member, John Sweeney, in as president, and now their protege, Richard Trumka, runs it for them. They took over every single major labor union, 
SEIU, AFSCME, NEA, United Auto Workers, you name it, they run it. And they use that leverage to take over the Democratic Party. They purged out all the moderates, all the old Dixiecrats, the old conservative Democrats, and you used to have a lot of conservative Democrats, folks. Remember, it was the Democrats who set up the House, House Un-American Activities Committee. You had heaps of conservative Democrats, but they have got none now. Joe Lieberman, the senator from Connecticut, was the last one to go. Now they own that party. 15,000 communists own the unions, and the unions own the Democratic Party. And they are writing their policies. It's very simple. The communists come up with an idea. This is what we want for America. A modernization of green loans, bans on fracking. It might be a new marine reserve. It might be um, a new start treaty with Russia, a nuclear deal with Iran. It might be Obamacare. All of those things are communist policies, people. They make them union policies, and the unions make them Democrat policy. But I want to talk about one that I think is, of all of them, is probably the most dangerous, and that is comprehensive immigration reform, otherwise known as amnesty. Now, you have Republicans, people, John McCain and Lindsey Graham, this is inverted comma Republicans here, who tell you that amnesty will be great for the GOP. Because if you give 8 or 10 or 12 or 20 million illegals citizenship and voting rights, they're all going to be so grateful they'll all become staunch conservatives, right? <laughs> Look, we know that the Latinos, who are the bulk of the illegals, not all of them, but the, the biggest sector, are often very socially conservative, good Christian people, but they vote 80% plus Democrat. Have done for years and will do for years, folks. Maybe that will change in 10, 20, 30, 40 years. Maybe. But we've got one election cycle left, folks, before this country goes past the point of no return. They ain't going to change in that time, folks. So why do these Republicans tell you this garbage? Could it be connected in any way to the fact that the US Chamber of Commerce has spent more than $1.7 billion promoting amnesty in the last 10 years? What do you think the Chamber wants out of it, folks? Cheap labour. Don't you think they'd want to pay an illegal $8 an hour rather than pay you $20? Doesn't it make economic sense from, from their point of view? But this ethical business and this unethical business, you know, I'm all about profit, I believe in profit. But I think ethical profit is when you make money but you pay your bills. Is that fair? But the cost of amnesty is going to be the impoverishment of towns all over your country a massive increase in disease and crime, the lowering of, lowering of respect for the rule of law in your country, and the massive endangerment of your national security. Massive endangerment, people. They are big costs. Who's going to pay them? You think the Chamber's going to pay those costs, folks? You're going to pay those costs. So the Chamber takes the profit, and you take the costs. Is that ethical business? And is it any coincidence that the Republicans who tell you this stuff tend to be the ones most closely allied to big agribusiness and the Chamber of Commerce? Or am I being a little bit over-conspiratorial? What do you think? But the real driver of amnesty is the communist movement. Any refugees from California here tonight? <laughs> Tell me if I'm wrong, folks. This started out in California back in the 1950s with a Communist Party member named Bert Corona. 
He was also a big time Democrat. He set up the Viva Kennedy Clubs, the first organized effort to bring Latinos into the Democratic Party. He also set up, mainly with Saul Alinsky money from Chicago, a whole network of support groups for illegals in the southern border states and California. The purpose of these groups was to encourage illegals across the border, get them work in the factories and farms, and get them citizenship. Now, Corona trained a whole bunch of acolytes to carry on his work for him. Three of them are very prominent today. They work together as a group, and they've transformed California. The spillover has come here. The first of these is a man called Antonio Villagarosa, until recently the mayor of Los Angeles. A hardcore Marxist, he used to go down to Cuba to cut sugar cane for the Castro brothers. He turned Los Angeles into a sanctuary city. He forbade the LAPD from enforcing immigration laws and the illegals flooded in in the hundreds of thousands. Changed the entire demographics of the state. Second member of this group, a Communist Party supporter named Gil Cedillo. Until recently, the Democratic head of the California State Senate. He is the man who recently got the bill passed that gave illegals driver's licenses so they can now vote. Third member of this group, another hardcore Marxist, the most powerful woman in Southern California in my opinion, until recently the head of the California AFL-CIO. She now sits on the Democratic National Committee. Her name is Maria Elena Terrazzo. She is behind the massive union-driven and union-paid-for Latino voter registration drives and get-out-the-vote efforts that have added hundreds of thousands of new Latino voters to the California rolls in the last 15 years. Almost all of them Democrats. The result of this deliberate Marxist program has been to turn California from a reddish, purplish state to solidly blue. Now, all of the Electoral College votes from California, 276 I think it is, every single election cycle goes straight to the Democrats. No contest. Completely locked up for the Democrats. Very important every presidential election cycle, folks. You imagine if California was still in play for the Republicans. Make it a lot easier for you to elect the president, folks. But the real driver of this today, the man who's driving this today, is a man called Alisao Medina. You've seen him on TV, wearing a purple shirt, leading an amnesty rally. He is, uh, until recently, a, a vice president of the SEIU union. He's a member of Democratic Socialists of America, a Marxist. He supports the Communist Party USA. Until recently, he served on Obama's Latino Advisory Committee with several other Marxists. He is the man who got the amnesty bill pushed through your Senate about three years ago. He then worked with Luis Gutierrez, the Democratic rep from Illinois, to try and get an amnesty bill through the House. And guess who stopped that, people? You stop that. Ted Cruz, yes, but it was you, the Tea Party, that stopped that. The Tea Party that won Dave Bratt the election in Virginia, that stopped amnesty. Nothing else, folks. But uh, Luis Gutierrez, by the way, is a former member of the pro-Cuban Puerto Rican Socialist Party, a Marxist-Leninist outfit, which does not stop him serving on your intelligence committee in the House of Representatives, by the way. Now, when that failed, thanks to you guys, <coughs> Medina went straight to the president and demanded executive amnesty. And Obama amnesty five million people with a stroke of a pen. Right before your last election, hugely unpopular, he knew it would probably cost him the Senate, but he still did it. Now I want to ask you a little question. 
any former or current union members here tonight? Not persecuting anyone, just want to know. Okay. Well, here's a question, guys. You tell me this. Which organisation in America, 25 years ago, was the most hardcore, militantly opposed to illegal immigration? Unions. The Teamsters, AFL-CIO, Cesar Chavez and the farm workers. They had people on the border, folks. They were turning people into the INS. They were constantly lobbying Congress to increase penalties on any employer employing illegal aliens. And do you know who their champion in the Senate was? Harry Reid. The most hardcore anti-amnesty person you could find, folks. So, but in 26, because, you know, the union members understood. Illegals cost them jobs. Illegals lower their wages and conditions. Very logical to oppose them, right? But in 2016, which organisation is the most hardcore in pushing to legalise the illegals? So unions, SCIU, AFL-CIO. So why were union members so militantly against illegals 20 years ago and now they're promoting them? The answer is simple. Before 1995, the unions were there to represent the interests of their members. After 1995, when they were taken over by Democratic Socialists of America and the Communist Party USA, their agenda changed to promoting socialist revolution. The illegals are disastrous for union workers, folks, but they are great for the revolution. Now, what do you think the union bosses care about most, people? They are selling out their members' jobs every day, folks. Every day of the week, taking their dues, selling their jobs down the river, because a revolution comes first, folks. And it took Alessio Medina, the Marxist, five years of hardcore arm-twisting inside the AFL-CIO to get them to flip their official policy from anti-illegal to pro-illegal, which he achieved at their national convention in Louisiana in 2000. The Marxists did it, folks. It ain't easy to get union members to vote directly against their own interests, but he did it. But why does he want it? That's the real question here. Why is this Medina's life's work, and why did Obama grant amnesty right before an election knowing it would probably cost the Senate. Well, Medina let the cat out of the bag at a big progressive conference in Washington, D.C. in 2009. I've got him on tape saying this. I quote him in my book, and it's going to be in my movie that's coming out. He gets up in front of the comrades and said this. Passing amnesty is the number one priority of the progressive movement. We have to get citizenship and voting rights for our 11 million undocumented workers. 11, 12, 20, 30 million, who knows? And did he talk about compassion, reuniting families, giving immigrants a break, the American dream? Not a single word, folks. All he said was this. In 2008, Latinos voted overwhelmingly for Obama and progressive candidates. If we stand by these people and grant them citizenship and voting rights, they will stand with our movement. That will give us at least 8 million more Democratic Party votes. That will give us a governing majority, not just for the next few election cycles, forever. Think about it, people. Mitt Romney lost by two and a half million votes. You give the Democrats eight, ten, twelve, twenty million more votes. How are you ever going to beat that, folks? The first thing that happens is that Texas will go blue. And if you take the Electoral College votes from Texas, 
your second most populous state, add them to the Electoral College votes of California, which they already got through illegal immigration, do the math, people, add it up. It makes it virtually impossible to ever elect another Republican or Conservative president, ever. One party state. And if you think the Democrats are arrogant now, what do you think they'd be like with 8, 10, 12, 20 million more votes in their pockets and you permanently out of office? Would it just be the IRS they send after you? Would this country become like France or Germany? I wish. Or would it become like Nick Venezuela pretty darn quickly and Cuba not long after? Because that is the plan, people. That is why they're doing this. That is why Obama granted amnesty just before an election, because he is a Leninist. One step backwards to get two steps forwards. He granted amnesty, didn't give a damn about what it did to the Senate, because he knew that amnesty was the road to the one-party state controlled by the Democrats, who are controlled by the unions, who are controlled by the communists. And you have Republicans, people, telling you this is going to be good for the GOP. These are not stupid people telling you this. They can add up numbers. I bet you they know exactly the totals of the checks they got from the Chamber of Commerce. Yet still, they want to give the Democrats 8, 10, 12, 20 million free votes with no plan to counter it. What do you call people who sell out their own party and their own country for a bit of campaign cash, folks? Well, that brings me to another subject. Okay? Because these people who are destroying your country, I think they need to be held accountable for what they're doing, folks. Now, here's a little question. I know there's a gentleman over here who's an expert on this. You tell me if I'm wrong, sir. Anybody in this room, not counting military, ever applied for a federal government job who is willing to admit it? <laughs> Did any of you people require any form of FBI or security check clearance for those positions? Yeah. Quite a few of you. Okay. Even the post office used to do it. Yeah. So I know that they can be pretty darn thorough. They can go through your underwear drawers, check out your family background, overseas travel, criminal convictions, drug habits, dodgy political affiliations. I had a friend who applied for a federal government job out of Virginia about two years ago. The FBI drove two agents all the way to Canada to interview that man's communist uncle. On the strength of that interview, my friend, a staunch conservative, was denied that position. Not because he was a communist, because his uncle was a communist. And I'm going to tell you people, I actually support that decision. Because this is the federal government we're talking about here. This is the heart of the free world. This is the guardians of liberty for every free person on this planet. And this country has enemies who have a history of using your weak and dishonest to betray you. And which is more dangerous, folks? An enemy out there or an enemy in here? What does your constitution warn you about? It warns you to protect your constitution from enemies foreign and domestic, does it not? You're very, look, this country is so willing to send your brave men and women overseas to fight those foreign enemies. But what are you doing about the domestic ones, people? Because they are betraying your troops overseas every day. Every day. Think about this. If you're a if you're a, if you're, okay, if you're a young communist, you're a young Marxist radical and you 
hang around with the local unions and the local Democratic Party. You know, someone like Paddy Murray, for instance. <laughs> someone like Jim McDermott, he's a bit older, but he's even worse. Someone like Nancy Pelosi or Barbara Lee or Barbara Boxer or Eddie Bernice Johnson or Sheila Jackson Lee or John Conyers or Rosa DeLaro or Tammy Baldwin or um, whatever, whatever. You hang around with the local communists and they decide they want to get you elected to Congress because you'd make a great Liberal Democrat. And they get behind you and they put the union muscle behind you and they finance you and they get you elected to Congress or even the Senate where you may serve on the Judiciary Committee, the Homeland Security Committee, the Armed Services Committee, even the Intelligence Committee, where you have access to all sorts of government secrets and the ability to influence public policy and direct the Iran nuclear deal, for instance. Okay? How much of an FBI security clearance does that one take, folks? Nothing. Because the people are supposed to vet the candidates, right? And the media is supposed to help you do it, right? Yeah. right. Well, how's that working out? People, if you were a foreign intelligence officer serving undercover, say, in the United Nations, which has hundreds of them, from North Korea or Iran or Cuba or Venezuela or Russia or China, and you had allies and networks through the communist parties and the labour movement of this country, and some of them had the ability to get their secret members or sympathisers elected to your Congress, where they could do your enemies' bidding, do you think your, those foreign enemies, those foreign intelligence officers, are so stupid and lazy they do not exploit that massive hole in your national security? The most powerful legislators in the Western world, folks, the most powerful people on the planet, with access to all sorts of secret information, and the most influence of anybody on the planet, and no effective security checks, what could possibly go wrong, folks? Do you think those foreign intelligence officers do not exploit that hole in your national security? You imagine if you're a North Korean intelligence officer and you serve for five years in the United States and you're mixing with American congressmen and you go back home and you tell your bosses, they say, well, did you manage to recruit any of them to help us? You say, oh, no, well, I didn't. How do you think that's going to go, people? What do you think is going to happen to you? It's wide open, folks. I quote in my book, Raul Castro, the dictator of Cuba, boasting in the pages of the Communist Party newspaper how members of your Congressional Black Caucus, about 40 people involved in that, set up by the Cubans in my opinion, go down to Cuba on a regular basis where they talk to the Cubans about how they're going to work inside your Congress to get trade and travel restrictions lifted on Cuba, which they're just now doing, right? So now the Cubans can send more spies and more drugs and more terrorists to your country. Do you remember that the Cubans tried to blow up Macy's on New Year's Eve in New York back in the 60s? How many Americans would have died in that one if the FBI hadn't caught them, folks? So now the Cubans can set, start up more LA riots and more Ferguson's and more Baltimore's. What do you call it when someone goes from your country to an enemy foreign country to help them against you? What's the penalty for that one, folks? So why is it happening every day, people, and nobody does a darn thing about it? And it's been going on for a while, I've got to say. Any, any, I know some several military guys here today. Any Vietnam veterans in the room tonight? One, two, three. Okay. First thing I'll say, gentlemen, is thank you very much.
Then I'd like to ask you a couple of questions. One of them is a very stupid question, but I think you'll see where I'm going. First one, was the Vietnam War lost in the jungles of Vietnam? Okay. Is it true you had some pretty tough rules of engagement? You weren't allowed to bomb Hanoi Harbour. You had to notify targets before you bombed them. You couldn't um, chase the enemy across borders in hot pursuit. You couldn't, uh, sometimes you couldn't even return fire without getting permission first. Sometimes you weren't allowed to bomb, you know, you weren't allowed to hold territory. You had to allow the enemy to reinfiltrate. Is any of that true? Yeah. So th this is the dumb question. Do those rules hamper your ability to fight and win that war? So had you been allowed to fight like you did in World War II to actually take the fight right to Hanoi and actually fight to win, could you have won it and pretty darn quickly? So, and is it also true that when you withdrew, your, your Congress defunded the South Vietnamese military guaranteeing a communist takeover? Okay. So you lost 58,000 men in that war, folks. Over 100,000 wounded. Hundreds of thousands of Vietnamese who suffered death, torture, imprisonment, execution after the communist takeover. 58,000 of your boys, your classmates, your high school buddies, your cousins, your uncles, your comrades in arms, 58,000 men lost in a war you were not allowed to win. Well, I say this, that war was deliberately sabotaged in your Congress by people like Father Drynan from Massachusetts who were working hand in glove with the Communist Party USA, which was taking its orders directly from the Communist Party of the Soviet Union, which was allied to the Communist Party of North Vietnam. You'd think there might have been a little bit of treason going on there, people. And how many of those traitors who condemned tens of thousands of your boys to completely unnecessary deaths, how many of them paid a single penalty for what they did, folks? One of them is now your Secretary of State, folks. And he's doing it to you all over again. And what about John Conyers? How long has he been in Congress now, people? 140, 160 years? <laughs> but think about bumbling old John Conyers. He is the most powerful Democrat in your house, folks. Because he is the ranking member on the Judiciary Committee, the body that writes your laws. When the Democrats are in power, which they have been in most of his tenure, he has been the head of the Judi Judiciary Committee. The Judiciary Committee writes your laws and it oversees the Federal Bureau of Investigation and sets its budget. Which organisation is supposed to be rooting the traitors out of your government, folks? So John Conyers has got a 40-year history, with a 50-year history with the Communist Party USA, 40 years with Democratic Socialists of America, 20 years with the Workers' World Party, which supports North Korea, Cuba and Iran. And he's got an extensive history with the Muslim Brotherhood. John Conyers is a hardcore, anti-American, Marxist, Leninist. As hardcore as you can get, folks, yet he oversees the budget of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. What do you think is going to happen to the FBI's budget if they ever come after John Conyers or his many communist friends in your Congress, folks? Can you see the problem there? So you're a young Marxist radical, you get elected to Congress, you're serving on the Armed Services Committee and no security checks. But if anybody does come after you, John Conyers is going to shut down the investigation, folks. What about Judy Chu, who also serves on the Judiciary Committee? 
Back in Greensboro, North Carolina in 1979, there was this crazy group called the Communist Workers' Party, pro-Chinese communists. And they had, they, te they, they just, they got onto the local Ku Klux Klan and they baited them and baited them and challenged them to a battle in the streets of Greensboro, North Carolina. Both sides turned up armed and when the dust had settled, five people lay dead in the streets. You can Google it, Greensboro Massacre, it's on YouTube, you can see the battle, people. Pretty extreme, don't you think? Well, that group learned the lesson from that, and they turned, changed their name to the New Democratic Movement, and they started to infiltrate the Democratic Party. And they had a front group called the Federation for Progress. And this woman called Judy Chu headed that front group. Then she got elected through the California State Senate with the help of former Communist Workers' Party members. Then she set up the Asia Pacific Caucus in your Congress with the help of former Communist Workers' Party members, one of the most powerful bodies in your Congress. And then she started going to China on a regular basis to build business ties between China and California. The Chinese press calls Judy Chu China's representative in your Congress. Judy Chu still works with the Communist Workers' Party today, now, while she serves on Obama's re-election committee. And you want to see Judy Chu when the FBI has the temerity to arrest one of the thousands of Chinese spies operating in this country. You want to see Judy Chu get on their case, people. You want to see Judy Chu embarrass them and give them a hard time and try and shut them down to the benefit of the Chinese spies operating this country. And you want to see Judy Chu go on to care meetings, Muslim Brotherhood fronts, and then she works to help them as well. And you want to see Tammy Baldwin from Wisconsin, one of your senators, a former member of the pro uh, of the uh, uh, the El South, no, the Colombian Support Network. That's a communist group. Includes Bernadine Dawn, Billy as his wife, which supports the Colombian narco terrorist guerrillas, the FARC, <laughs> communist guerrillas who fund their revolution by selling cocaine into your country. You want to see Judy Chu every time there's a vote in your Congress to grant military aid to the Colombian government fighting those communist guerrillas. You want to see how she gets on the case while she works to shut down that military aid. You want to see Judy Ch uh, Tammy Baldwin helping the Colombian guerrillas in your Congress, folks. And they are on the verge of taking over that country right now on peace talks, which she helped to broker, which will put the guerrillas into the government, so now they can send even more cocaine to your country, folks. <coughs> you have got at least 100 members of your House and 20 members of your Senate who could not even hope to get an FBI security check to sell you stamps at the post office, folks. They would not be allowed to clean the toilets at any military base in your country. Yet they're serving on the Armed Services Committee, the Homeland Security Committee, the Judiciary Committee, the Intelligence Committee. Nancy Pelosi just put Andre Carson of Indiana onto the Intelligence Committee, a man with extensive Muslim Brotherhood ties. So now he's overseeing all 16 of your intelligence agencies. Do you think I'm exaggerating, sir, what I'm talking about security checks? This is a man who used to do security checks for the military. And he told me before this started, I hope I'm not talking out of turn, that most whole bunch of your local representatives in this, in this state wouldn't have a prayer of getting a security check. And neither would your president, and neither would Hillary Clinton, and neither would Joe Biden, or any of the other leaders you have up there right now. None of them would have a chance, folks. You think that could be a bit of a problem? You think that 
You think the Russians would tolerate a hundred pro-Americans in their Juma? Do you think the Cubans would pro tolerate a hundred pro-Americans in their parliament? Or the North Koreans? Do you think they'd be that crazy? But you have left your internal security wide open, folks. You're so brave and committed to fighting the bad guys outside, but where is the attention on the bad guys inside, folks? But I don't want to depress you people with any of that. <laughs> or bring you down in any way. Am I too late, folks? <laughs> way too late. Please don't walk out now. It does get better. Okay. Look, if I thought there was no hope for America, I'd be back in my beautiful New Zealand right now, building bunkers and stocking up on baked beans. Okay? I'm not mocking prepping at all. But this is how I see it, folks. In 2008, all those 60s radicals who'd been burrowing through your unions and your Democratic Party and your media, they finally had it in the bag, people. They finally had their ducks in a row because they had the House, they had the Senate, and they had their man in the White House. And they were going to have their revolution. They were going to shove all their agenda right down your throats, people. Who did they have to worry about? John Boehner? Was he going to stop them? But in 2009 and 2010, something miraculous happened. Something I didn't see coming. Some of you might know what I'm talking about. You. Where had you been hiding, guys? You came out of nowhere and you blogged and you marched and you emailed and you rallied and you phone banked and you put some much-needed spine into the Republican Party, and you took back the House in 2010. Everybody in this country, with one exception, Carl Rove, know that it was you guys who took back the House in 2010. And somebody really should tell him, folks. He's embarrassing himself. You took back, look at 2008, Obama could walk on water. He was practically the second coming. But two years later, thanks to you guys and Glenn Beck, he lost the house in a massive landslide. Who could have predicted that one, folks? But what that did is it brought the agenda of the left to a grinding, screeching halt. They had it in the bag. They were breaking out the vodka, people. They were going to ram a Obamacare straight down your throat, all the way to single payer. They were going to give you car check and cap and trade and green <coughs> jobs. They were going to gut your military to ribbons. And they were going to have 8 or 10 or 12 million illegals voting in 2010 and 2012 and 2014, folks. They were going to do all of that but you stop them. You may not have noticed, but I've noticed the Tea Party doesn't get a lot of thanks for what it does. Okay? It's quite a lot of the opposite. Right? But I'm here to say thank you from the bottom of my heart, people. Because if it hadn't been for you, this country would be done now, and so would mine. If it hadn't been for you stopping the Democrats, they would have got those illegals voting in the last two elections, and where would you be now, folks? You may not see your value sometimes, because you're in the thick of it. You're fighting every day. And sometimes when you're in the battle, you don't see the big picture. But I'll tell you, there are millions of people around this planet who understand that they owe your free, their freedom to you people, to what you have done and what you're going to do. You're the most valuable political movement we've seen in this country for a century, folks. And never, never forget it. Ever. I want to do something now that's normally considered very bad manners. But I'm a Kiwi and I can go home, right? Because you don't go to someone else's country and give them advice, do you? You know? But sometimes I get asked for it. Look, I have been, I tell you what, I've been to 43 of your 57 states now. 
see you're awake, see if you're awake. And I get asked the same thing all the time. What do we do now? Do we work with the Republicans? Do we just do local stuff? Are we wasting our time? Is, are we just banging our head against a brick wall? Well, this is what I say. My only value to you is as an outside observer. My advice, my thing is this. You've got one election cycle left to win this, people. You've got to win, because if you don't, the Democrats are going to keep the southern border open, they're going to flood your towns with refugees from the Middle East, and they're going to swap you forever, folks. That is their plan. They're doing it now. I was in St. Cloud, Minnesota. That's Michelle Buckman's district, most conservative part of Minnesota. 60,000 people in that town. 20,000 of them are Somali Muslim refugees. What do you think that's doing to that town, folks? To the education, to the crime, to the voting patterns. What do you think it's doing to that district? Come on, people. You think I'm exaggerating? You don't think they would do that? I know they would do You see what's happening to Europe right now? Done by the same communists in Europe who are doing the same thing to you now. Angela Merkel, by the way, people say she's a conservative, right? Angela Merkel was the head of the East German Communist Party's youth group. She was their ideologist, trained in the Soviet Union. The German uh, Democratic, uh, Free Democrats or whatever were told by the German security services, do not let that woman lead your party. She's a security risk. And now look at what she's doing to Germany, folks. Elections have consequences, and lack of security has huge consequences. They can't say they weren't warned. So this is what's, this is how I see it, people. You're going to win this one. And I want to go back to 76 now, because I think this shows where you are and where you've got to go. Back in 1976, you'd been losing your liberties, Republican, Democrat, Republican, Democrat, for decades. Tweedledum and Tweedledee. The people were pretty darn disgusted. But that year, they finally got a choice. That year, a man came out of California who spoke of a shining city on the hill and peace through strength and liberty and the Constitution. And hundreds of thousands of grassroots people got fired up by Ronald Reagan's message. And they thought, we'll pile into the GOP, we'll join the Republican Party, we'll help them get the nomination, we'll take the country back. And they thought they would be welcomed. They thought they'd be welcomed. And what did the Rockefeller Republicans, the Carl Rhodes of the day, what did they think of Ronald Reagan and his supporters, folks? Despised them. Hated his guts. Ronald Reagan was far too extreme. He's a crazy right winger. He'll destroy the Republican Party. Ronald Reagan was banned from Ohio in 1976 by that state's GOP, folks. That's a fact. You know, no matter how many Reagan dinners they might hold today, that was their attitude back then. And they just beat him in a contested convention. Just beat him. They gave the nomination to Gerald Ford, and Ford went up against Jimmy Carter, and Carter won. How did those Carter years work out, guys? <laughs> Barrel of laughs, were they? Interest rates up to here, gas queues round the corner, gave away the Panama Canal, gutted your military, a Iranian hostage crisis, your second worst ever president, people. Yeah. Think about that. Yeah. But look, you remember how bad those final Carter years were. There were people seriously saying that America would never be great again. You remember that? Well, the grassroots, the people just like you, stayed the course. They got into those Republican Party precinct committees, the VOCs, the township committees, the nominating bodies of the party. When Reagan ran again in 1980, this time they were fired up, this time they were angry, and this time they refused to take no for an answer. They forced the GOP old guard to give them their candidate. And they got the nomination for Ronald Reagan. He went up against Walter Mondale, I think it was, and he took him out 49 states to one. 
Shame on Minnesota, folks. <laughs> Not bad for an unelectable candidate, right? Not bad for a crazy right winger. 49 states to one. A massive landslide. People, the Iranian hostages were back on inauguration day. The interest rates went down. The taxes went down. The economy boomed. He rebuilt your military and he rebuilt the pride in this country. And he took out the Soviet Union without firing a shot, folks. Any better president in the 20th century? Anyone even close? And why did you have a Reagan revolution, guys? Because for once, it was the grassroots who got to decide the candidate. Could there be a message for today? Because right now, people, this country is Jimmy Carter on steroids. And you need Ronald Reagan on meth to turn this around. You've got to go way beyond Reagan. You've got to gut your federal government and restore your constitution. You know that, guys. But how do you do it? Because Reagan was a genius. He could, get, he could unite the social conservatives, the fiscal conservatives, the defence conservatives. He could bring those conservative Reagan Democrats across. He could fire up the evangelicals. Big evangelical vote that year. But you may not have heard people, but right now your base is a little bit fractured. A little bit of division going on. You've heard about any of that, have you? Okay. Yeah, Tea Party versus Republicans, Trump versus Cruz, you know, there's a, a little bit of friction going on in the base, right? We are a few months out the most important election in your lifetimes, folks. Can we afford to be divided? Can we afford that? With the media against us, the vote fraud, the union thugs, can we afford to be split? Well, how do you unite? Because this is what's going to happen. I think there is going to be a contested convention. I think that's going to happen. And please remember the difference between contested and brokered. If Mr. Trump does not get 12.37 before the convention, they're going to go in there, and after the first ballot, they're going to keep balloting until someone gets over 50%. And I think, based on what I know, I think Mr. Cruz will prevail. But when I, look at this, you know, I think that will happen. I'm not trying to upset Trump people here. I'm just saying that is the man. If Trump gets 12.37 before it, that's what happens. But I don't think that's going to happen. So at that point, you're going to have a situation where 40% of the, whichever one wins it, 40% of the GOP is going to want to throw its toys out of the car. Right? They're going to walk, want to walk away. It's either going to be the Cruz people who want to walk away or the Trump people who want to walk away. So then you've got Hillary charging away there. But I'll tell you another thing. I don't think it's going to be Hillary. If Ted Cruz gets the nomination, I think they're going to indict Hillary and they're going to give you Uncle Joe Biden and Pocahontas Warren as a running team. Okay? So that's just a prediction, right? But either way, either way. So what are you going to do to unite the party after a convention like that? Because it's going to be a pretty badly split party, in my opinion. Whoever gets it. Even if John, John Casey, whoever gets it, you know, it's going to be split. So this is what I would do if I was Mr. Cruz after that. Trump could do this as well. I would name my VP immediately maybe even before, and I would suggest Carly Fiorina. Yeah. Yeah. Because I'll give you a reason. A, she's a great candidate, but B, you're going to have a woman on the opposing ticket one way or another, either at the, at the top or on the VP. And Americans do not like women being beaten up by men. They're not quite so worried about women beating up other women. Okay? <laughs> so it will be very handy to have a woman on the ticket. Okay. Then I would name the entire cabinet and run as a team. And the first person I'd put on there, I'd, I'd want to get those libertarians over, I'd put Rand Paul on secretary, as Secretary of the Treasury. Okay. 
and he can do anything he damn well wants to the Federal Reserve and the IRS, carte blanche. Okay? And then I bring out Sarah Palin and make her Secretary of Energy, and it's going to be drill, baby, drill. Drill in your backyard if you want to, folks. Dollar a gallon gas for every American family. And then you've got to break the power of those unions. So who do you think would make a great Secretary of Labor? Scott Mr. Scott Walker from Wisconsin, Secretary of Labor. And then, you know, you may have heard, there's quite a lot, the federal government thinks it owns a lot of land out this way, right? They sort of, well, they think they do. I would make, take Mike Lee and make him sick out of the Senate, make him Secretary of the Interior, and his job is to give the land that you own back to your state. And who do you think would make a great Secretary of Health and Human Services? Ben Dr. Carson. Ben Carson. Your job, Mr. Carson, is to end the welfare culture in this country, get people back, get dignity back to your communities. And you want to get rid of Common Core and the Department of Education, there's already a governor who's proven he could do that. Make Bobby Jindal the Secretary of Education, folks. Bring it in. And I would make a suggestion for Secretary of State. I would suggest John Bolton for that role, okay? And his job is to flip the bird to Mr. Putin and the Ayatollahs <laughs> and to rebuild the Western Alliance. And very vitally important, ambassador to the United Nations, Noah. <laughs> Name your entire cabinet, Mr. Cruz or Mr. Trump. Run as a team across this country. Would that inspire you guys? Yes. And would it unify the base? Yes. Because everybody's getting something, right? There's something for the libertarians. There's something for the evangelicals. There's something for the Tea Party Republicans, the moderate Republicans, the Second Amendment people, the land rights people. There's something for everybody. And aren't you all Americans? Yeah. Don't you all deserve representation in your own governments? Yeah. You imagine, see right now, every four years, the Republicans put up a candidate and the liberal media rips them to pieces. But what would the liberal media do if Ted Cruz or Donald Trump was running across this country backed up by a team of 20 Rottweilers are all backing each other up and not taking any crap from anyone. How would the media handle that one, folks? How would they possibly do anything against that? See, right now, Ronald Reagan had an army. He had a great army. But you think of the work that Glenn Beck and Mark Levin and all these guys have done in the Tea Parties and the 912s have done to educate the Americans in this country the people in this country, about your constitution in the last five years. Yeah. Ten years ago, you have, you have a conference on the constitution, you, get a, you do it in a phone box. Now there are hundreds of thousands and millions of people who have read the constitution and want to stand for the constitution and fight for the constitution. You put that army together with a team of leaders like that, folks, who would stand in your way? Who could resist that, people? A unified base of fired up conservatives. Who could stand in your way? See, look, there's a precedent for this. Reagan named his cabinet in 76. Lincoln named his enemies to his cabinet to unite the country in the Civil War. And you didn't just have a founding father. You didn't just have George Washington to lead your revolution. You had George Washington and Samuel Adams and Patrick Henry and James Madison, and Thomas Jefferson and Benjamin Franklin. John. You had a whole sorry? And John Adams. John Adams, sorry, sorry, sorry. You had a whole team to lead that revolution. And they were human. They had their egos. They had their conflicting agendas. But they put them all aside for the sake of the revolution and the good of the country. 
And look at what they gave you, people. Look at the amazing country that they gave to you. So what I'm asking from you, folk, I know what politics cost you. I know the time, the money, the commitment you put into this. I know the time away from your families, the sacrifices you make, with hardly a thank you. I know what this cost you, folks, because I've done this myself. But I'm asking for even more of it. Because the next few months is going to decide the fate of not just this country, but my country. Not just of your children, but of my children. I can't promise you very much, but I can promise you two things. If you do nothing, your children will live in slavery in this land. But if you give it everything you've got, folks, for that right up to November and beyond, if you give it everything that's within you for your country, your God, and your constitution, the very least I can promise you is that you will earn the right to look your children in the eye and say, I did everything I possibly could. What is that worth to you, folks? And if you win, and you can win, you can definitely win this one. If you win, you will give your children not just the amazing country that you inherited, but one even greater. You will spark liberty revolutions all over this planet, folks. Is that worth fighting for? So I want to say to you guys, thank you so much for what you do for America, for my country, and for liberty. God bless America, and God bless the Tea Party. Thank you very much. So as we close this part of the uh, speech, you might as well stay standing up because I'm going to ask you to do it again here. You know, we give our guests uh, an honorary membership uh, at Penn, right? At Kids at Patriot Tea Party. But as you see, Trevor's already got one. So we thought that we should give one to the real power behind him lately, and that's his new wife, Victoria. Would you please come forward? Give her a give her a good hand. He's got to put his glasses on to do this. All those in favor say I do. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm going to give Trevor this spank and new t shirt. And you too can have one of these, right? Right back at the blue table. Right. So, one more round of applause for Victoria and for Trevor. Thank you. Thank you. Look, I, I just want to say thank you so much, both for the hospitality and being willing to listen, but, but mostly for what you do, you know. I, we only come here because you guys are doing what you're doing. I'd be completely wasting my time if I wasn't. So I just want to, proud to be amongst you, grateful to be invited, and just keep doing what you're doing. That's, that's all I ask. I know you will. So thank you. And if you want any books, or take, come, come and see us or ask more questions. But it's just great to be here, and I hope to come back sometime. And we're putting a movie out in May and June too. If you want to hear news about it, put your email address on our sheet, and we'll keep you updated when the movies come out, etc. All about the commies in Congress. And the tagline is going to be: Could your congressman pass an FBI security check? Thank you, thank you. Thank you, back for taking any of your questions. Thank you for coming tonight. Uh, your board will be here for a few minutes if you want to visit with the board. Drive safely. Thank you, everybody.